Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to our fourth session of Electronic Pulse. Uh, my name is Markus Kleinfercher, and I will be your host today. Short reminder up front, we will be recording our get together today. So, Alex, um, I would like you to press, press record on this occasion. Um, if you feel comfortable with that, you might as well leave your cameras on or off. Uh, it's up to you. For everyone joining us for the first time, you might ask yourself, what is Electronic Pulse? Basically, this is a framework where we meet on a monthly basis, or at least we try to meet on a monthly basis to hear about startup success stories within the electronic sector. And in addition, provide the opportunity to network and uh, give valuable insights into the startups themselves. Next question you might want to ask yourself is who is organizing all of this? We are a network of corporates and national institutions who all support the entrepreneurial mindset, and we are eager to connect each other and everyone to this startup and innovation ecosystem. Uh, on the one hand, there is Infineon Austria with the Infineon Hub at the Technical University in Vienna, where I am the coordinator. On the other hand, this is also um, our partners from industry meet makers with Sandra Stromberger, the FH Technikum Vienna with Raphael Rasinger and Eva Maueda, and of course, uh, the Austrian Wirtschaftsservice with Fiona Gmeiner. Today's agenda will consist out of uh, um, yeah, us introducing ourselves and um, afterwards uh, we start right into today's session with our special guest Malta Wolkinger from, from Blue Danube Robotics and Airskin. We also want to invite you to stay until the end to have a short uh, Q&A session with our guests. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I would like um, to give the word to you, Walter. Thank you. Stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Yeah, my name is Walter Wolkinger and I'll tell you about um, Blue Dynamic Robotics, what we do, where we're from, uh, and so on. This is more focused for um, entrepreneurs, uh, students who want to uh, start a startup. Um, so you learn a little bit of um, what we did on, on our journey. Um, so my talk will consist of of uh, introduction of um, Airskin and Blue Dynamic Robotics, the companies. What do we do? Um, then a little bit about myself. Um, who am I? What do I do? And how do I uh, get to start Airskin and Blue Dynamic Robotics? And then the interesting stuff on the founding story, uh, the pitfalls, the funding, and all the lessons learned uh, from developing hardware and especially safety certified hardware. And then I'll show you some uh, reference projects, videos of what we do and an outlook on what Erskine is doing, what I'm doing, what the whole field is uh, going to, uh, to do in the next years. To start, I'd like to show you, I'll give you a, a short context. Um, we are in the automation business and there there's one big theme overall is there's a huge potential for uh, robot-human collaboration uh, because of two reasons. Um, one is the most of the easy tasks have already been uh, automated. So in the, in the automotive industry, they know how, how automation is to be done. But all the smaller companies, uh, SMEs, they are just getting uh, started with automation. And uh, Second big reason is that there are so many tasks and occupations out there uh, which can be automated, but not to a full extent, but just to just a partly automated. And there, there's a huge opportunity there. But for that, you need machines which are able to work with humans uh, in the same workspace. So this is um, the context for what we wanted to do and what we did with Airskin, but more uh, on that uh, later on on the founding story. 
So what is Erskine doing at the moment? So the company is called Blue Denim Robotics. Um, we produce safety sensors, which are directly mounted on robots. Um, with that, you can add these sensors to robots and have them work in real collaboration uh, with humans in the workspace. Um, these sensors are safety certified sensors. It's a safety device by two Ofchia certified and two Rheinland. Um, we sell them at the moment uh, internationally. We produce them here in Vienna. So we have an office in the 22nd uh, district of Vienna. We have the production there. So we do all the plastic uh, components, uh, polyurethane uh, molding. Uh, we do the development and programming of the electronics, get them uh, manufactured somewhere, and then do the uh, assembly here and uh, ship it from here, from Vienna. Also, this is our sales office, and we have some uh, partners around the world who help us with uh, distribution. Our main focus is, of course, uh, automotive. So Magna Ford, Continental, these are the companies they are used to automation, and for them, it, it's easy uh, to switch to uh, collaborative uh, solutions. But we are trying to get uh, into the, the food sector as well, because there is also a huge uh, potential there. Yeah, how does the Erskine uh, look like? Is a, a good example on the reaction we get if we show the, the video. Um, to customers or they're asking to customers. This is at the uh, uh, Japanese fair with uh, together with KUKA. So the white uh, the white pads are the Airskin mounted just on a standard industrial robot. Um, in the case of collision, so if you touch the robot or get uh, hit by the robot, um, it sends a stop signal to the robot. Robot stops. So it's it's a quite simple solution, but it's nice. Uh, because it's modular, we can cover the robot, we can cover the tool. So it's it's quite um, uh, useful for different kinds of applications. It's not only limited to robots. Um, yeah, as I said, it's Blue Daniel Robotics, but our product is called Airskin. And so this was the first lesson uh, we learned that it's best to go to the customer with one brand and not with two. Um, that's why we switched uh, two years ago to Airskin. So now it's purely called uh, Airskin.io. That's our new uh, website uh, where we sell uh, the Airskin products. We are, folk, we are purely a, a B2B uh, a company a business. So we sell Airskins for KUKA, Stoibly, and, and Epson. These are our main customers. Yeah, um, how, how does the technology work? Um, that's actually the nice thing behind Airskin, the simplicity. So uh, when we started, we thought, yeah, this is actually a great technology because what we do is it's just um, an airtight skin over a dampening structure. There's air inside. Um, we put a sensor in there. We measure the uh, air pressure variations. And once you get in, you uh, get in contact with the with the pad, it deforms the surface. This increases or decreases the air pressure. That's what we measure and send a signal. So it's quite simple. Um, and it has a, a, a huge advantage um, because it's just air. So you can do any shape. So uh, if you compare it to other technologies like um, uh, electronics board, you can have like these flex boards but you only can flex it in, in one direction, bend it in one direction, but here we can make any shape out of it. So that's actually quite nice. And we also have customers, they use it in, um, in, the, in the medical imaging where you actually cannot have metal components in there. So you have the air skin and you have the electronics on one side and you can have the, the, the uh, most of the plastic body inside the machine. That's quite nice. Yeah, this uh, air skin is quite robust and simple. Um, yeah, it's, they are modular pads. 
um, connect uh, magnetically and they are robust. So yeah, we have we have them in, in different uh, machines on robot on mobile robots everywhere uh, machine builder uh, sees the use of it. Um, and now my last slide uh, into uh, technology. Um, there is a standard out there. Uh, it's called uh, ISO TS 15066. And that's the nice thing about standards. It's, it does not limit the technology. It just says you can do whatever you want. But when the robot uh, is in a collision with a human, these are the limits uh, you cannot uh, exceed. Uh, so they have two limits, uh, force and pressure, and that's actually perfect for air skin. Because we put the air skin on, on the machine, you get in contact, it's a soft surface, it tampens the collision, it spreads the, the pressure out. So the pressures are quite low, uh, neglectable even, and it's an active sensor, so we can keep the forces low, and you can actually move with an industrial robot faster than with these cobots, these lightweight robots out there. Yeah, so our initial idea um, was the same in 2014. Um, take a standard industrial robot, take Earth King, combine these two, and um, extend the capabilities of, uh, of a standard industrial robot. So what we call it, it's the best of two worlds standard robot, industry proven, you already have a market, people can operate the, the, the robot, and then you add air skin, and so you remove the fences, and you can have it uh, in your uh, production environment without any fences and laser scanners. So it keeps working even, you can pass by quite uh, closely. Yeah, and our technology is not limited to these small uh, robots and cobots. Um, this is our biggest robot, so it's 20 kilo payload, two meter reach, where we can do um, palletizing, visual inspection uh, next to a car. We have the huge reach, so you only need one robot for the whole car. Um, yeah, lots of application possible with this technology, and it's safe for humans to be around, so you can create um, quite a different uh, kind of uh, production line in your uh, uh, facility. No fences, uh, much more densely packed uh, machines. Um, no fences which uh, obstruct your view. So this is actually huge potential uh, one can do with that. Yeah, um, who am I? Um, what do I do? What did I do? And how do I came to uh, found blue in your robotics in the air skin? Um, so I'm actually from the field of uh, computer science. Um, I studied at the Technical University of Vienna. Um, funny story, um, I was always interested in, in robotics, um, but I needed a, a master thesis. So this was Back then, in 2006, Google, it's a paid diploma thesis, robots enter. And then I found a different institute I did not know before at the, at the Technical uh, University of Vienna, uh, Electrotechnik. And actually, they were looking for, for a computer vision guy doing um, edge tracking for industrial stitching of carbon fiber mats using a laser range finder on a cuckoo robot. Ah, oh, this was great. I, I did that. Uh, it was, was quite a nice experience. And then I came in contact with these um, roboticists and, and the robots and mobile robots. And actually, I said, this is, this is great. I'll, I'll stay there. Um, yeah. I stayed there for a, a few years, did my uh, PhD there. Uh, and while I was there, I worked at several projects uh, doing classification of furniture, uh, grasping of different objects with uh, industrial robots. And then there was the project Hobbit, where we developed a mobile robot with an arm on it, 
uh, for elderly care. So it's it's picking up objects, doing fall detection, move around in a in a uh, unstructured environment uh, of the elderly. And there we thought, we should build this. We should found a company and build a mobile robot with arm with all the Japan. This is a great idea. Yeah. Now comes the founding, the founding story of, of, of Erskine. Um, actually, I met my colleague, uh, Michael, who was a PhD at the same institute. I did not know that he wanted to start a company and he did not know that I wanted to start a company. We met at an in its workshop. So it's good that they have these uh, startup centers around because there you meet people. We said, oh yeah, then let's do it together. Yeah, but our initial business plan did not um, survive the first contact with the market and with the um, uh, funding agencies here in Vienna. Of course it did not do. I mean, we were technicians, roboticists. We know nothing about market. There's no course back then. There was no course at the university. Um, yeah, so our business plan was way too ambitious, not enough time in there, um, too much money requirement. It was, and it was not just, uh, um, it was the risk of was high, but it was also not the right timing for, uh, in the market for this product because the, the cost, um, were just too high for such a robot if we want to offer this uh, in the market. Yeah, then we looked at the at the robot. We actually built this prototype, and all you see on on, on the on the left the, the blue pads, these were the uh, initial air skin pads. And we thought, yeah, I mean, we need air skin because we need we move around in an unstructured environment. The the arm is moving. We need this technology there, but maybe it's too much. Let's just take the the, the air skin out of our portfolio of like six different technologies we had in there. So we showed this uh, on a fair uh, in Honova in 2014. Yeah, and then it hit us because then um, companies approached us, ThyssenKrupp, Samsung, they found us. We had just one little table there showing some initial technology and they found us because they, they look, were looking in the in the list of uh, ex exhibitors and they saw, oh, um, there's like a, a robotic skin. This is interesting. Yeah, so in 2014, we said, okay, that's actually, we are onto something. Um, so we started looking for our first customer and starting developing the air skin into a safety sensor. And this was actually a good thing that we did not know how hard it is to develop a safety certified sensor. Uh, because it took us a little longer than expected. So we had the company founded in 2013, uh, me and Michael. Um, we got the first um, funding from uh, AWS. Then in 2015, uh, two colleagues were working already uh, with us, uh, joined us in, uh, in the next company, uh, in the uh, uh, GmbH. Yeah, and then we got our big funding, the uh, AWS seed and some uh, pieces, angels, and we got some money from uh, friends, family, and fools. Um, yeah, in total, we got like one and a half million of uh, euros in funding and 400,000 euros of revenue just by selling prototypes to uh, different uh, robotic companies. Uh, offering development services in the uh, cobalt sector. So this was back in 2014, 15, where the, the, the cobalt market was just starting. So this is for the beginning of the, um, of the mainstream uh, movement. So during our uh, development phase, we did a lot of prototypes. So on the, on the left, you see the first air skin is just a foam in, in, in latex uh, and our first robotic arm. And then we developed different kinds of uh, air skin for, for Como, Festo, Stoibli, ABP, 
just try different different things, um, trying out different manufacturing methods. Um, turned out, certification of uh, safety certification of electronics is hard. Takes a lot of effort, but we had no idea that actually mass manufacturing of of, of parts and, and uh, plastic components is really hard. And there was not a manufacturing method out there which actually fit our um, requirements. So we had to develop them also. Yeah, so you see there are mostly uh, industrial robots there, but there's one outlier uh, on the right top. This is a uh, universal robot. So this is a lightweight cobalt, which actually does not fit our definition of what we want to do. We want to take industrial robots, uh, combine it with air skin and, and do best of uh, two worlds. Yeah, because people saw this air skin, uh, we got some uh, initial requests. So this was at the beginning where people started uh, using uh, these cobots and they, have, they, they had these uh, safety issues when they use these uh, cobots. Um, they had clamping uh, issues and they needed a safety sensor. So we said, oh, okay, maybe interesting. We have a lot of requests uh, for this universal robot. We just make the air skin for the universal robot. Second lesson learned. We sold a lot of them, but actually they did not fit our, our, um, our strategic goal and our uh, vision. So um, we now got, uh, got rid of it because it's just too expensive. It does not fit. The message is not clear. And now it makes much more sense just to have the air skin for the KUKA, Stoibli, and, and Epson uh, robots. But we did not, we, make, we made one huge mistake there. We did not test it uh, really in the market early on. So we spent three years developing this selling this, but it was not the market success we, we hoped for. What was the market success um, is uh, Stoibli and KUKA. These are two um, established companies having their range of robots, but lacking collaborative robots. So this was a perfect match for us with these uh, companies. Yeah, so the next years we uh, showed the, the robots and the air skin to um, all these, uh, these different kind of fairs. We won what you can win in Austria, more or less. Merkur, Huska Preis, Phoenix, Austrian Robotics Award, Staatspreis Design, and so on. This is nice. Um, but what's important is have a close relationship with a customer, develop, with, develop the product with your customer, it's much more um, valuable than uh, these prices. They are fine for, for marketing efforts, but for uh, product development, get your early customer as we did with Stoibli and develop the product. So, and then 2018 comes along and there, there are five major uh, points happening there. First was, we got our first official white label customer. It's Stoibli. They came out with their uh, new product line featuring uh, TX2 Dutch, which is the air skin uh, on their robot, just branded in, in Stoibli style. This was a major event for us uh, because we could use their, their sales channel and they, they sold a lot of, of these robots. Then we finally, in 2018, got our official safety certification. So we started in 2014 and we thought we do it in two years. Uh, it took us nearly five years from starting to work on air skin till we finally had a certification uh, of the safety sensor. Third is we got our patents. So we have now seven patents and one trademark. Uh, not worldwide, but in the biggest uh, robotic companies, uh, countries, so Europe, Japan, Canada, US, South Korea, and China. Um, yeah, we're quite, quite happy with our patents. Uh, in retrospective, it's quite expensive to have all these patents. Uh, maybe it's better just to focus on a few patents and then 
build your technology, um, uh, improve it in, in such a speed that the others just cannot follow. I think that's, that's even better than, than to have lots of patents because it's quite expensive uh, in, in the years uh, following the initial uh, uh, patent approval. Yeah, and also in 2018, uh, we finally uh, got into our um, mass production. So um, we had our 3D printing uh, material ready, the uh, printing partner, and we started uh, with our polyurethane uh, spray casting uh, manufacturing line so we could produce this in, in series. Yeah, and the least but not Last part is, uh, last but not least, is we got funding. So we found an, an Austrian uh, investment firm. So it's the uh, ADV. It's the former B&R uh, owners. They sold their company to ABB. And with that money, they invested in uh, different Austrian uh, mechatronics companies. And we were lucky uh, to be one of them. And this is a long-term partnership. And this is something uh, we are really proud of to have found the right partner for us because it's a hardware company. You need a lot of investment to get the production running, um, to have all this investment done. And um, the sales cycle are with uh, B2B in industry, especially is a little bit longer. So it's good to have a strong part in the background who helps you um, get the product uh, into the market. Yeah, um, now let me show you some uh, reference product uh, projects um, we have done to see your skin in action, um, see what we are going to do next, where the market is going, what we as Erskine will do, and so on. Um, one thing I did not mention explicitly in the beginning is the end of ARM tools. So Asking, we can do a lot of um, not just the robots, but also the end of arm tools. So we can uh, build uh, almost the whole application. Um, we um, we have um, our big robot out there, which has uh, six space, um, increases flexibility, and has the highest speed out there in all these different kind of uh, cobot applic uh, applications, if you compare it to cobots. Um, and what we have seen out there, there are a few applications which are quite common. So it's it's a lot of uh, palletizing and handling, um, visual inspection, um, gluing, and also greasing. These are nice applications for, for our uh, collaborative uh, robots. Um, now let me show you a few of these applications. So this is a fully uh, integrated uh, lenser robot. So there is a gripper and a camera doing uh, electronics uh, assembly in an uh, integrated line. Then we have our partner uh, Epson. Uh, with the SCADA Flex. So this is a standard uh, SCADA type robot. You get Erskine on it, you can you, can, you get it as a full uh, package. So robot and Erskine. Uh, so you can uh, put it in your uh, production line, no fence is needed there. Then we have a, a mega robot. So this is uh, with the company uh, Lear in Poland. They're doing uh, seed manufacturing. So there is a visual inspection application where we use a standard industrial uh, cooker robot, have a camera there, and the, and the robot is switching between two uh, workstations, left and right. When the worker is preparing one, the robot is, is checking if all the bolts and holes are made on the, on the left one and then work and robots switch places um, 
And this is, of course, also done without a fence, without a laser scanner, uh, just by adding air skin uh, onto the robot. Then we have also uh, automotive uh, manufacturing where you have usually uh, a conveyor, a moving conveyor. So you connect the robot with the moving conveyor and then do these uh, inspections. And what's nice here is we can even go into this uh, moving, uh, moving product. Um, the end effect of the camera is mounted magnetically. So if there is a collision, uh, it will fall off. So there's no risk uh, in, uh, of any kind. But this is a quite unique uh, uh, application uh, made together uh, with uh, KUKA. Yeah, um, I don't have a video here, um, but this is our biggest robot, uh, a big ABB uh, at the Magna uh, factory. So uh, here the use case was lifting uh, baskets with CNC uh, parts into a washing machine and getting the washed parts out of, out of there. Uh, it was done before uh, by humans lifting the heavy uh, baskets into the machine. And now humans just put the, uh, put the trolley there. Um, the robot is working for 10, 15 minutes autonomously, feeding it into, into the washing machine. There's no fencing um, and, uh, and saves a lot of space. So um, on, the, on, the, on the bottom here, here starts the next machine. So actually in the same space, you usually have a uh, need for uh, this solution with a fence. They could install uh, two of these washing machines. So saving space and replacing uh, the worker who has to be there every 10 minutes lifting the heavy uh, um, baskets into the machine. So this is a, a quite uh, nice uh, use case. The future of air skin. Yeah, maybe you already know, um, but the future is mobile. So uh, the industrial robots um, are there, um, but customer need more flexibility um, and new customers uh, emerge. So it's not just the automotive and the, the tier one suppliers, but more and more small uh, and medium-sized companies uh, start to do automation. Um, and also companies not in this automotive sector, but in medical rehabilitation, they also see the, the, the advantages of robots. They are now um, available, easy to use. Yeah, the fear of, of using robots um, significantly lower. Um, yeah, but robots will continue to um, get into these new niches and the service sector will, of course, be one of these uh, niches. Putting a, a robot on a mobile platform has a lot of advantages. You can use the same robot for uh, multiple tasks um, in a flexible production environment. Um, and once, what we learned is also that customers need complete solutions. So. Blue Dynamic Robotics uh, sells AirSkin as a safety sensor, usually to an integrator. Uh, the integrator buys the robot from KUKA or Storbly and then builds the solution, um, gives it to the customer, and see it's a huge uh, capital expenditure. Um, what we are now going to do is that we uh, will found a new company uh, to provide complete solutions to the end customer or he just uh, gets a robot as a service, a fenceless robot as a service um, from us. Um, so he does not uh, need the specialist to operate the robots, no capital expenditure, and it's flexible to uh, put into uh, his uh, production lines. Um, another area where um, one can see the, the air skin is uh, sports equipments. Um, we have developed a smart boxing glove 
uh, was also a, a research project with the technically, technically University of Vienna. Um, so uh, this is already out there. It's actually coming to market in a few months. So you can train smart with the boxing glove. You can measure the force you bring up uh, in your training force with an app. Yeah, so this was the talk about Airskin, how we funded the company Blue Dental Robotics, how Airskin is a great technology, safe space, um, I get higher speeds on, the, on these uh, industrial robots. Um, it's, um, it provides a lot of um, advantages regarding safety, but you also heard it it's a hard way to develop hardware, especially safety certified hardware. Um, but nonetheless, it was a great journey and we will expand our product portfolio. And I'm looking forward to offer the market the robots as a service. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Walter, for your insights into your startup and the founding process. Um, it's great to see a, a hidden champion here in Austria again. Um, maybe we can start into a quick Q&A session. I see there is a lot of applause from, from the audience. Thank you, Max. Um, yeah, maybe I, I, wanna, I wanna start with the first question here. Um, you said you can in increase speeds uh, with robots equipped with Airskin. Can you manage um, going up to quasi static speeds, like the 1.5 meters per second, as you mentioned at the beginning? Um, yeah. So um, the nice thing, asking, it's just a big cushion filled with air. Mm -hmm. So uh, with our production uh, method, we can even increase the thickness of asking, so we can reach 1.5 meter per second with an industrial robot, because it's it's all about uh, absorbing the breaking distance of a robot. That's that's the most critical uh, issue here. And we can do that. And no other robot with a hard surface can achieve this speed. It's it's, it's physics. That's the nice thing. It's, okay, it, under no, understood. No, okay. okay. Because that would be my, my, my follow-up question here. Um, can you disclose the reaction time of the system? As you said, it's probably the time it takes for the robot to actually slow down or yeah. full, full stop, right? That's the yeah. reaction so, time here. So the air skin, it's about 4.5 to 9 milliseconds. So uh, best to worst uh, reaction time. Um, but then you have the, the, the safety uh, uh, PLC in, in the middle, adds another 20 milliseconds, then the robot adds another 20 milliseconds, and then it starts breaking. So yeah, it's not the air skin. The air skin is quite fast, but all okay. The, other the, things just the, the, the overall reaction time of the whole yeah. system. Okay. All right. Yeah. And um, so you're only limited by the thickness of your air, air skin, basically, when it comes to speeds of the robot, basically, right? Air skin. Yeah. Thickness of air skin. And of course, of the of the workpiece. Um, of course, the more mass, the long it takes to uh, slow down. But what we see the applications out there, it's it's not that you lift these heavy uh, items in a fast way. So the heavier is the, the heaviest thing we lift was uh, with v, uh, VW a gearbox out of a crate. You lift it like with 100 millimeter per second, it's just lifting it and putting it somewhere. Like there's no need for speed there. Um, if there is a need for speed, um, then you usually have like palletizing, you have boxes. If you get hit by a box, it's, it's already soft and all right, but understood. Okay, okay. You need to find the right application for uh, these collaborative uh, applications. All right, thank you. Maybe some other questions from our audience. Uh, if you have any, please feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask them directly to to Walter. I have some 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 more questions up my sleeve, so be quick. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I have one one comment I forgot to mention. Um, about funding, um, it, Austria is a great country, especially Vienna, to, to start a company. There are lots of options out there to get funding. 
but beware of the timing. Uh, we, we had the luck that both times uh, when we applied for funding, um, the government was not in the best shape and there was, were some switches and finance minister needs to sign the, the funds. So don't plan on the standard three to six months funding cycle. Add some extra time in there. That's we learned it the hard way. We had to get some extra um, funding in the in the meantime when we had to wait on the already uh, approved funding. So that's that's proof for startups. Get enough money, plan enough time in there. Yeah. That's that's good to know, and that's why we are here to hear uh, advice from experienced startups <laughs> to maybe. Uh, give to the people who are in the process of probably uh, funding hardware startups. Yeah. I have a question here in the chat from from Max Munster. Thank you very much. Uh, so he he asks. So the air skin themselves can act as a shock absorber or airbag if we increase the size. Uh, yes, an airbag. So we are not inflating it, but yeah, it absorbs. It even uh, absorbs energy, spreads it out. Yeah. Okay, and the 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 air skin itself it is a, a closed system, right? So you don't have yes. to uh, yeah. plug in any air supply for the duration of of its usage. Usage. It's, it's a closed it's a closed system. Okay. Um, in the electronic, there is a small uh, piezo air pump, so we pump air from the surrounding into the pad. It's just a tiny fraction, four hundred pascal. Um, just to increase to have a little bit of overpressure in the pads to detect uh, if it's leaking. Interesting. Similar to your, your, what you have in your modern car tires, just a, a, a pressure check. All right, all right. Um, all right, Max says, so thank you for your, for your answer. Um, another question here from the chat, how do you find a manufacturing partner for something so specific? Thank you, Beatrix, for your question. Um, yeah, great question. We spend a lot of time. So we put enough effort in there and got get lucky. So we, we got lucky that we found a, a 3D printing partner in uh, Upper Austria. Um, uh, he is a specialist in, in plastics. Uh, he got us connections to all the, the, the other companies, and then we developed uh, the special material with him, um, started 3D printing. So this is this was one section. Um, and the other one is, yeah, talk to people, find other people. And in the end, we had to develop the, the production system for our uh, air skin, for the uh, polyurethane spray coating uh, method ourselves. So we even have a patent on it. Because there was no method out there, and believe us, we tried every method. So we have different uh, kinds of air skin in our storage facility, where you can can see the different stages and the years. What we, what we did, what we tried, uh, but no one uh, met our requirements. So in the end, we had to yeah develop even the manufacturing process ourselves. Yeah. That's that's quite some challenges, though. It's quite, yeah, it's challenging, but even for, for the cabling. So we have, um, on the picture there, you see this uh, black cable. Mm -hmm. So it's outside of the robot. Um, so this cable has magnetic connectors. So if you put your hand in there and robot moves, it automatically unplugs. Uh, it doesn't break because just magnetic plugs. We had to develop the magnetic plugs ourselves because there was no plug out there, was no plug out there available for us. There was a million, Military plug in, in the UK. They did not even uh, write back on our requests. Yeah, so we manufactured ourselves, designed it, and have partners around Vienna, like four or five. One does special cables, one does the, the plug, one does manufacture. Yeah, so we had to build our own supply chain. That is that is so awesome. I can I can only fo follow up here with uh, the comment that Sen uh, <laughs> uh, gave. Uh, it's really impressive uh, your story and and um, what you've accomplished over the past years, as well as Beatrix uh, says. Thank you for sharing your inspiring story. Uh, it's an awesome product. I I totally agree. Um, 
I, I got still some some more questions. We got time until six, so um, let's let's keep it fast here. Uh, you've you've talked about funding and about the timing and stuff like that. Um, would you have been able to to expand without a VC, or was it essential for a hardware startup in general? Um, no, you, we we would have if we if we had chosen another VC than than uh, the one we have chosen, um, or did not find a VC. There's no way that that we can we can do it, because as 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 we talked about, we, we need to develop cables, connectors, Erskine Electronics, uh, the, the the plastics, then do all the certification, then do clean room, what what not, um, and then you need to to sell the stuff. No, there's a lot of um, money and time involved in in Harbor. It's not just like a software startup who can bootstrap uh, and just uh, have a, a small office and, and do the stuff now. So you need external money to, to finance it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, they stay profitable. I got, a, I got another question here from Max. Um, one more question, if, if you don't mind. What do you think is the most important thing you create or do in your company that it keeps innovating and thriving? Um, listen to the customer this is that's a good answer so important to to have an open ear for the customer and then talk with him maybe not just sell him but but listen what he wants to do what he wants to do in the next three four five years um yeah we have a list of customer wishes um what they want to do yeah we cannot do it yet that's the thing so they need a bigger robot, a faster robot, a uh, robot with additional sensors on it. And yeah, lots of different applications. Yeah, as, as you said before, there is, you, you got to do some market research before you get into into it because it's like a key success, uh, success factor for you to yeah. you know, have a positive start into a market. And yeah. as well, as you saw in your in your funding story, um, you actually realize over time what your real uh, US, USP is um, by uh, uh, going on a um, messe and, and having uh, other companies discover your Airskin product, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Another yeah. question here from, yeah. from Beatrix. Um, when you started, uh, did you really have a definite idea of your target markets? Uh... How to answer? So we we knew the market um, was um, op, um, automotive tier one. Um, we knew our target our target customers are more or less the the robot manufacturers who do not have a collaborative robot in their portfolio. So we are actually not only we are selling to the end customer, but we are also somehow sell to to these robot companies because if they do not have the air skin they cannot compete in this collaborative robotic uh, market space um, but what we did not do at the beginning is to uh, focus on one or two so in the videos you saw that or in in the, in the history slide you saw there is a a Festo, a Denso, a Mitsubishi, a Puma. So we don't, did a lot of trials um, to get an initial prototype going. Um, and then the companies uh, try to get it into the market. Yeah. And then you need a little bit of luck to, to hit the right uh, customer. So yeah, it's, it's hard, especially if you start something like that um, in the beginning of a hype. So there was this um, cobalt market the hype. Everyone was doing cobots. And the last two years, people realized what you can do and what you cannot do with cobots. Uh, and now it's it, it's way better. Some some years before, we got questioned with, oh, can you put the airskin on and, and move with five meters per second? No, no. 
you cannot have a collaborative robot with this speed. <laughs> and if you could have, it makes no sense to have a robot with this speed next to a human. It's, it's the wrong question. <laughs> yeah, so the market was not ready. Yeah, yeah. A lot of market is ready. We do, I did a lot of workshops, webinars, just talk to customer to explain how they can even use cobots in, the, in their uh, production line. So we knew somewhat uh, what our market was, but we did not expect that the market was that underdeveloped. Understood. Okay. And maybe one last question before we wrap it up for today. You mentioned that the speed of your startup evolving is much more important than the patents you hold. So what would be your next big thing, your next goal? Um, and can you imagine, like speaking of service robots, as you mentioned uh, at the end, um, can you imagine like also those high speeds um, on service robots, mobile robots equipped with your air skin technology probably? Um patents um yeah it's i think it's it's really important to innovate and i think to innovate is not just to create a new technology but to combine existing technology into solutions um the, the market out there there are a lot of components out there and you need a lot of specialists in there um i think where you can be faster than any patent is that you create a solution for the customer who is swept away by its uh, simplicity um by its business model um what what we saw in, in in the past is that people need automation but they know it's expensive it takes six to nine months from start to uh, to have to receive the the robot cell but usually the customer needs another, I don't know, six to nine months to get the budget um, and to decide on the robot model, decide on the on the integrator. This is just a long cycle. Um, so I think if, if, if we can supply the market, especially the smaller companies who are faster than, than uh, moving than the, than the big ones, they can adapt faster. If they get their hands on on robots as a service, um, fanceless mobile robots, I think this could be a huge market and a huge boost for um, our uh, local economy here in, in Austria. And that's what, what we are going to do with our new company, taking all these um, components, the technologies, Erskine uh, locally produced, uh, European technology, put them together in solutions and offer it uh, to the market. That's great. I'm looking forward to to your success story expanding over over the next period of time. Okay. So yeah, all right. I think that is that is it for today. It has been a very interesting and insightful keynote. So thank you very much, Malta, for taking your time today and elaborate on your startup success story. Uh, a big thank you also to our viewers um, thanks for the time and your participation. It was great having you here. Also, keep an eye open for future uh, uh, keynotes of the Electronic, electronic Pulse um, framework. Um, you can find it under infineon.com slash hub. I posted it here into the chat. So, yeah, that's it for today. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy and hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.